he has a food truck too, but he's actually oh. thinking about, he's kind of switched his mind. He was going to open a brick and mortar for his food truck, but now he's taking it to a place in Florida to run the food truck while it's cold here so that he doesn't have to miss out. Boy, he's a, he's quite an entrepreneur. He's in Florida and Missouri and every place else. Well, anyway, why don't we, Charles, I'm sure you have a dream, but why don't we start on Roy's? Royce, do you want to read your dream? Because it's the yeah, yeah, okay. the typical Roy dream. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I had this on uh, September the 19th. I was standing in a creek near my old home place. Animals were around. I was standing below a small waterfall. The water was polluted. I thought some people move to live near water that is not polluted, but I choose to live in the place I am when water is polluted. A dog, Bosco, the family had when I was a kid was sinking in a pool below the waterfall. I pulled him out. A black kitten was struggling in the water. I picked her up and climbed up on the dry land. The kitten was biting me. I put her down on the ground. Then at a distance, I saw a rabbit and her babies. Instantly, I recognized it was the great mother. Well, this, this is such a, uh, um, you, you know, the thing is, is the, uh, it is every bit as holy as, uh, as a dream with religious images, but it's just full of, of these elemental images. You know, but to me, it is just absolutely sacred, you know, the whole dream. But now, uh, so let's just go through the obvious things. I mean, first of all, Roy, before we start, why don't you tell us what you think about the dream? And because I think that, that the fact that you are so close to nature, so close to elemental, sometimes fools us a little bit. Plus the fact that I think you have a very good feel for what the dream's about. Yeah, I, I, it just, it, it showed my concern for nature and uh, in all life. And, uh, and I was participating in it. You know, that's kind of how I feel about it. Well, you know, um, it is, uh, first of all, let's just, I, I'm just going to start, go through the images. Just, you know, to, uh, because they're beautiful, each one of them is, you know. Now, you are standing in a creek near your old home place. So it's it's, it's place of origin. It's the, pl it's the returning to the point of departure or something like that. But you're not in the house. You're at the stream of life, you know. Water is, first of all, it's representative of the great mother, but it also represents this undifferentiated life, this revivifying thing, as opposed to dryness. You know, dryness is, uh, it, you, you know, is something that is sterile, has no uh, uh, life in it. It's dead and desiccated. But anything that is, is wet is fecund, you know, it's, it's, it is something that, uh, you, know, you know, when babies are born, waters flow out. It just, it, it, and it really does represent this undifferentiated life, you know, and it has depth and uh, it's very mysterious. You know, it has this, whenever the waters are near, you know, uh, that not only the unconscious, but the unconscious is life. You know, this is, this is something I was uh, just discussing this morning in, in my act of imagination. Is the, uh, you know, the, the unconscious is not lit by the light of ego, you know, so it's dark, you know, and the, uh, and, and the water represents unconscious, so it does not have the light of ego. And yet it is something that ego desperately needs. You know, just this uh, 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 this other that is not human. You know, but it's it's very important. Uh, now, uh, 
Uh, I'm going to put that in the chat one more time. Hi, Tim. We're just discussing uh, uh, Roy's dream here. It's it's just a. I, I'm kind of going on and on about it, but it's it's. I just think it's so uh, beautiful, and I've been thinking about things like this too. Let me put it in the chat again. Okay. Anyway, um, you you were uh, animals around. So so the uh, the creek is near the place of departure. We've returned to the beginning. We're doing the spiral thing where you, you know growth is not linear. It is circumambulating a center. And alchemy said the same thing, that you just go around in a circle. But each time, it, it's a more subtle. Uh, you learn something each time. Even though it's over the same ground, you, there's now things different. And you know, uh, if you remember in the Red Book, the, um, the hermit you know, had the same book and was reading it for 40, 50 years. And he says, every time I read it, it's a different book, you know, and uh, I mean, it's because the words are each time have a different that the words have a different meaning, like the 23rd Psalm has a different meaning for a young person than an old person. You know, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadows of death, you know, I mean, this is just um, uh, it, it, it is this um, just uh, the, the, the home place is the point of departure, Every, high schools, um, childhood homes, and everything. Okay, now the animals are around, so the instincts are around, and also the archetypal world is near, and the world of nature is near. You know, this is just something I've, I've been really thinking about lately, is, you know, the, the, the wisdom that created me is the same wisdom that created the snake and the fish and the trees and the flowers and uh, insects and uh, uh, all life. So it's not human, okay? You know, it, this, it, yet it is, um, it, it, it is the same source in trees, fish, mushrooms, you name it. And this is the wisdom that is writing this dream right here. It's the same wisdom. So this aspect that it is animal uh, related, it, it's, it's um, we share the same wisdom. I don't care if you're a rabbit or a, anything else, but there is this thing that shaped our bodies is the same, you know. So anyway, uh, now we're also standing below a small waterfall. So um, you're not being uh, showered by the waterfall. You're just standing near it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a waterfall in, in near your old home place? No. Okay. So anyway, there's this idea of two levels, and one is water coming down. You know. Now, uh, an interesting thing about the uh, intuitive. It, it, this is what Marie Louise von Franz says is is they never see the waterfall. They only see the top and the bottom. And they all they're wondering about is, uh, is whence and whither. Where does it come from? Where is it going? You know, and, and the sensei is just looking at the waterfall. You know? But anyway, the, the, the fact that there is a waterfall means that there is a, a there, there, there's something about an upper and a lower place and the fact that the water's coming in. Um, you know, I'm just having fun with this. I'm, I don't mean, I don't know if I'm explaining anything. But now, um, the water is polluted. Okay, now what do you mean by polluted? Is it, is it just muddy and, and turbid or is it full no, of garbage? No, industrial pollution. Okay. Right. Sewage, uh, uh, industrial pollutants, dyes. Uh, yeah, chemicals. yeah, it's it's being um, polluted by the uh, uh, you, you, you know our, our modern world. You know, um, I just uh, wanted to uh, read a, a you, you know a little thing about um, the, this. Um, well, the, what Marie Louise von Franz says: electricity, 
power generation cars. They're all wonderful, but they separate us from reality. They separate us from, from uh, the whistling wind, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the feeling of a rainy day, a rainy night, uh, a, uh, um, the beauty of a moonlit landscape, the ever-changing aspect of nature and its natural surroundings. No longer uh, have we a share in the emotional experiences of our ancestors, which have been a part of man since he first came into being. The full moon, the whistling of the wind in the trees, link us to instinct and the life of the unconscious past. There is a whole scale of emotion which enriches our lives, nature, you know, the, the reality of living in a landscape of whistling wind, uh, uh, you know, shaking aspens, you know, quaking aspens. You've got those. I mean, isn't that beautiful to be on a mountain and hear all the quaking aspens uh, in the fall? Yeah, I've seen the aspens out west. They're beautiful. Yeah, I mean, they just make a little noise, Yeah, you know, and... Uh, it most uh, it, anyway, it, so now this stream is polluted. Now, what's it's polluted by? It's polluted by, um, by uh, things that aren't um, of the natural world. You know, things that are not of nature is what it's being uh, polluted by. You know, and um, now uh, most people choose. <laughs> this is a this is a beautiful statement. Now, this is sort of a realization of the dream ego, okay? Most people uh, choose to live and uh, live, uh, some people move to live near water that is not polluted, but I choose to live in the place where water is polluted. I choose. What do you mean by I choose? Do you mean that that's a conscious decision or that you're Fated to be there. It's a conscious decision. Okay, you're not going to leave, even though no. the water is polluted. And That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, do you, could you describe what the water? Well, you said industrial um, things, but it would be basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, those things that we take from nature so that we can live in a. Uh, in a modern world. You know, I grew up in an industrial town, a manu manufacturing town, man manufacturing at its height, uh, factories all around me, furniture, textiles, you know, and, and they just dumped everything into the river and creeks. Yeah, at that point there was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it's gonna go downstream, who cares? You know? They paved stuff with cinders from the uh, smokestacks. They used the old diesel oil to, to uh, pave roads with so there wouldn't be any dust, dirt roads. They just dump trash off the side of mountains, you know, clean out a back of a truck, just sweep it off down the mountain. Kind That's where I grew me. up. Hey, Gary. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that um, Mr. Peabody's coal train done hauled it away. You know, have you heard that song? Maybe. You know? Well, you know, uh, have you been in Muhlenberg County where, where paradise lay? I'm sorry, my friend, but you're too late in asking. Is Mr. Peabody's coal train then hauled it away? Hauled away the mountains and everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I saw a lot did. of my mountains get totally destroyed. I well, mean, yeah, hauled I mean, away by trucks and also they have these big machines as big as several houses that just creep through a forest and take everything down. Yeah, well, I mean, it was uh, Peabody coal mines. You know, they did strip mining. Oh and, yeah, strip uh, mine, yeah. we got it. Yeah, well, anyway, this, uh, so we, we, we are accepting the fact that we cannot live away from the polluted world. Hi, Gary. I just put, uh, we're discussing, uh, um, Roy's dream. I just put it in the chat. Um, so anyway, we 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 are you now. This seems seems like you, Roy, though too. I mean, you um, have sort of a bargain with civilization, but you also are very close to uh, 
that realm before that, you know. Now, here's the most beautiful part, you know. Uh, the instinct of our youth is drowning in this thing, and it's thinking to the bottom. Now, what did you do with Bosco? I mean, did, did you revive him at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I revived okay. so, But he would have drowned if you hadn't uh, pulled yeah. him out. Now, there's also a black kitten struggling in the water. And how did the black kitten get there? And, you know, I don't know. I just saw it. I don't know how it got there. Now, I didn't you it. have a dream like this before? Yeah, I was in Jamaica in a polluted creek. In a Jama yeah. my Jamaican yeah. dream. But, when I, when but wasn't sister. there a kit kitten or some young animal? That oh, drowned? yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had kittens in a lot of my dreams that I've had interaction with. Yeah, and they were drowning. I mean, it's sort of Stuff, like... Yeah. Um, it's similar to Charles dreams about the, about the uh, drowning, uh, but now you struggle it, uh, you pick it up and it climbed on the dry land, but the kitten was biting you. And you, so you put it down on the ground. Okay. All right. Now that's kind of the end of the dream I, uh, up until the, the punchline. Okay. All right. So we're in a Creek. Uh, I don't, I want to save the punchline for last. We're in it. We're we're at the at the place of departure. We're standing in the unconscious stream of life, the stream of life that feeds us. We are in the stream of life too, and we're in the midst of the stream of life. And there's a waterfall. So the the, the even the water is flowing down um, in, into that. There's this aspect of that um, that waters are flowing from above to down to us. So it, it, it's coming from, from the upper world down to us too, okay? And then yet this, this uh, stream of life is, is, con is contaminated and, uh, uh, you know, is, is affected by um, the air of Kusnacht, you know? Don't bring the air of Kusnacht to Bollingen. Well, this place is full of the air of Kusnak, you know, but we're going to live there anyway, you know, uh, which is, is, is a very uh, uh, courageous thing to do, or, you know, uh, maybe we don't have a choice. But then we find it. Now, the instinctive aspect in, in is drowning in this water, and we come to its rescue. So we're, we are rescuing the instinctive aspect that um, now, now see what would happen if the instinctive aspect uh, went in under the water and never came back up. You know, it's it's went into the unconscious. It sort of reminds me of the snake eating the homunculus in Charles. You know that um, it, it disappears into the unconscious, but we pull the instinct out before it can disappear in the pool under the waterfall and bring it up to land. So what we're doing is, uh, you know, uh, is bringing contents uh, that uh, we were once had in, in the outer world that have, have, are now going back down into the unconscious and we're re-bringing them up. You know? Now the kitten aspect, remember the dog in the, um, it was in the uh, a dream about the Shoeville store. You know, there oh, yeah. was a dog, dog and a kitten. Yeah. Yes. The well, it was both a dog and a cat. Yeah. So the dog is uh, this more, uh, in, and the kitten is is really the is is the anima. You know, she's. It's I'm rescuing feminine. the dog and the cat again. Yeah, it's a feminine presence, and uh, and the a dog is sort of our, um, the aspect of us that is, it's the body, you know, it really is the body and we're pulling uh, our body up into consciousness. So, you know, instead of it go, sinking down into the depths, we are wanting to pull it up into consciousness, our body. And then we're also saving the anima from sinking down into the depths too. So we're rescuing them both so that they'll be conscious, okay? Now, after we do those things, what happens? What happens as the result of that? We see 
a vision of the mother with her children. And we know that she's the great mother. It's, it's, it's extremely, now, first of all, the consciousness knows immediately that it's the great mother. But yet it's in a, it's in a um, mysterious form of the rabbit, okay? The rabbit and her babies. But instantly, we recognize it was the great mother. Now, who's the great mother? She is the source of all life. This is the great mother is the one who uh, out of her came trees, out of her came flowers, out of her came bears, out of her came elephants, birds, fish, snakes, everything. Her wisdom, uh, I mean her, let's not say her wisdom, but her uh, her creative uh, fertility produced all of those things. I mean, they came out of her. And you know how they came out of her? I, I have this wonderful image of, uh, of, the, of the Indian uh, Hindu god, creator god, Brahma. And uh, he, uh, he's the one that created all beings. And when, how he created them is they just appeared before him. You know, they were like uh, what they call the Buddha, Tapagata. They just come. Don't ask where they come from or how they came. They are here. Yeah. So it's the one thus come. And, uh, I, you know, it's just the great mother fills every niche. You know, uh, uh, a fisher in the Marianas Trench four miles below the sea is full of life, anaerobic life that has nothing to do with us. And then you've got life uh, in the ice uh, of the uh, Arctic, uh, uh, Antarctic, you know, down almost a mile deep, you'll find living organisms. Down there. But, um, okay, so uh, let, let's just review it real quick and I'm gonna shut up. We, we're at the departure point. We're standing in the stream of life. We, we are near a place where there's upper waters, and uh, uh, waters coming from the upper world, and there's waters that are flowing by us. And um, we rest, we find out, we find that this water is, is not the water of our ancestors. It's been um, contaminated by, uh, by a modern day, uh, ego consciousness and it's it's evils okay and yet we uh find there our body and our and our soul and that we're sinking down into the depths unless we rescue it. that's an alchemical image you know you go down into the depths and you rescue uh the, the your soul but you're not only rescuing your soul you're rescuing your body okay and you bring them up to dry land, and then who appears? The great mother. Is she uh, giving us a reward or uh, allowing us to see her or whatever? Um, what, what do you think, Tim? Well, I'm, I'm playing with these images. Um, it's, it's striking to me that that given a choice, you choose this medium that is anti-nature. I'm thinking about, you know, the, the symbol of water as being something you use to, to clean and nurture. And, and in this case, it would do the opposite. It, it poisons rather than cleans and nurtures. And so that seems to hurt the animal nature and it's curious to me that that the that Bosco is from your childhood rather than you know a a dog that you know now. So it makes me wonder if there isn't some kind of unincorporated flesh or some um, primitive uh, physical impulse or something like that, that comes out in these two forms. Bosco was from Montana. Oh, was he? Yes, he was. Wow. What kind of dog? 
uh, gas? Uh, um, no, a sheepdog. Border collie. Border collie. I was going to say oh, border that's collie. Pretty <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, um, it it strikes me that that you're. I don't know how this feels to you, but you're choosing to be a healer because you're in this situation where anybody who comes in contact with this is going to be polluted by the water. And here you are in this, you're right in the middle of it, you're standing in it, and you're rescuing everybody that comes along. And the, I think the great mother is, is witnessing that and being grateful for your action. That's what I've got. Yeah, and, and that's wonderful, uh, uh, Tim, you framed it that way. In, in, in two things, what, I really think that what you meant by he, that Bosco is from my childhood, are, there is an aspect of that we're rescuing the child within us. Who, and I mean, uh, I, we don't have dogs like that anymore. Back then, this dog was from Montana. My father was out there and, and picked it up because he used to go out there hunting. And it was so wild. I mean, you know, it, it run deer and it didn't live in the house. It was so wild. You know, you don't see dogs like that too often anymore unless you live way out in the country. Just lived outside, you know, it's outside dog. Didn't care about, itself. maybe it was really cold in the winter, you know, we'd let it in for a while, but it really didn't care about being in the house. Yeah, we had dogs like that that we never, they just fended for themselves outside. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't tie them up anywhere. <laughs> right. But they never ran no off. No fence. They you know. never ran off. If they did, they were out hunting or something. They'd be back for dinner. Yeah. Well, that's it. But, but at, to a certain extent, we're rescuing the soul and the child within us, you know, or some kind of, 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 of uh, the way Tim put it, it's really good. What do you think, Gary? Well, I guess I'm going to take it from a little bit different stance. And, you know, because, you know, I, I feel like the water, the water is a part of him. You know, the water is sort of like the, uh, almost like, you know, the, the collective unconscious or the unconscious. And so the water being polluted is, you know, that's the reason that the animals sink in this is that they lose consciousness, they lose their awareness. So it's not, it's not that the water you know, really has an aspect of, of good or bad. It's more that this is the work, is to pull things, you know, out of the, out of the unconscious, you know, it's, it's just part of the, of the growth. And so, you know, this is like a, uh, it's an act, you know, it's like, this is like, you know, he's seeing the process that's going on now. So it's like, it's like a little movie snippet that he gets to view of a, this is what's going on. And, you know, this is the unconscious view of where he's at. That's what I think. Yeah, it reminds me, you know, the stream of life that is untainted is, um, you, know, you know, they say in Zen that it is, uh, it is a higher wisdom to uh, achieve Satori in civiliz civilized mm. life than as a hermit, you know. So there's this aspect that the stream of life is tainted by civilization. But we know that we must be in both worlds. We can't leave leave civilization, even if it taints the water of life that's near us. We need to uh, accept the fact that our water of life is, is uh, 
tainted and polluted by civilization because we don't really have a choice. This is, this is where we are. You know, we, we can't go to the place where it's not tainted. That would not really be living uh, uh, our life. You know, what, what do you think, Charles? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel the same way about the uh, choice of living near the water that is polluted. It's like everyone inside them had, in their inner world has, you know, streams that are pure and streams that are polluted and most people will choose to live near the uh, pure streams so that they don't have to do the inner work of um, tending to the pollution. Um, but yeah, this, you know, Roy chooses to try to, you know, be conscious of the pollution and take care of it. Um, and I, the black kitten to me seems like a sort of, um, well, black cat can tend to be a like societally uh, rejected animal that has superstitious negative projections put upon it um, and makes me think of like, you know, um, the projections that happen during like the kind of, uh, when, it, you know, when any woman that seemed to be even slightly strange was a witch, you know, because everyone had wanted to throw projections on her. Uh, makes me think well, of the black is a shaman, though. You know, witch is a oh, shaman. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, like Salem witch trials and yeah. things, like, things like that. These, um, where in a culture we kind of created um, a situation to where, um, you know, we we didn't have room for female shamans, so we had to turn them into a negative uh, figure. But it just makes me think that the black kitten could stand for something that um, is uh, a throwaway aspect of the psyche as far as society is concerned. That's all I'm saying. Um, versus a white cat. <laughs> right, right. Um, and it's also the growing thing. It's a kid. Yes. Um, and also, also, I had a, one of my dreams for my hamster. I was saving him from a, some sort of bad living situation. He was biting me all the while, while I was carrying him to safety. He just clamped on with his teeth um but um yeah I, I agree with what everyone's been saying about this dream um he's wild it's a wild cat i mean it's a feral it's feral you know it is a feral cat the one that it's not it is not uh been domesticated or tamed it's black now this is this is just wonderful charles the black cat you know is associated with um with the pagan realms okay the realms of of witches and things but that's just the pagan realm i mean the the, the fact that the female uh, uh seer that you you know was uh was honored in in Lucius, you know is now considered to be a witch is somewhat like the uh uh, Pan, or uh, that was uh, has now been made the devil. You know, the, this this Dionysian force in the forest that represents the body. So, the idea there is is that the black kitten, it's the young, growing feminine within us that's related to the pagan realms, and it's feral, and we rescue it. But it's not, it's not of ego consciousness. It is very foreign from ego consciousness. But ego consciousness still uh, is, uh, knows that it, it rescues it. You know? So that, that's really 
is is beautiful. I think is uh, is an image. Roy, what what do you do? You have any further thoughts about the dream? I mean, it's and and that then let's we haven't even discussed with the great mother. The I, I might add that the pollution to me is like the new prima materna. I mean, it yeah. used to be like. Uh, trash heaps and swamps and sulfur gas and stuff, you know, which we're used to. But now it's like smokestacks and, and, and just all this plastic and artificial stuff. It, the new prima materna, that's where it went. And that's the worthless thing that nobody knows what to do with. Well, that's what uh, Marie-Louise von Franz said, too, that, that youngins, uh, 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 now I don't know if it has anything to do with the stream, but they said they uh, they they go rummaging through the trash heaps of history. So I mean, I, that's not exactly the same thing. No, but, this but, is this is a whole new ball game of trash. Yeah, right. It, it's, they didn't even it, have plastic back then, as far no. as the general person knew about. Yeah, I mean these huge, uh, you know several hundred square miles, six feet deep of, of plastic that's floating in the, in the uh, ocean. You know, that just is, is so uh, hard to fathom, you know. But uh, now let, let's just go over it real quick because don't you think this holds together? I mean, the, that, that it, everything makes, uh, it, one thing follows another, okay? One is that we are in, in our childhood. Secondly, that we are in the stream of life. Thirdly, that the stream of life, um, that part of the stream of life comes from above. So there's an aspect that there's a, um, there's a, a, a spiritual aspect to the stream of life. And then the uh, fourth thing is that the stream of life that, we, that is near our childhood home is... Um, is polluted by uh, modern uh, plastic, industrial pollution, all that kind of stuff. The stream of life. So our stream of life is polluted. And of course it is. You know, I was thinking too uh, of this, and you would know about this, Charles, is, um, you know, I go up to Minnesota a lot. You go from uh, Lake Itasca, uh, where the Mississippi River starts, and you go down about a, a little bit north of Minneapolis, and actually in Minneapolis. That's a wild river, the Mississippi River. It's completely clean and clear. And then, uh, so do you choose to live up in northern Minnesota? Not very many people live there. There's not a lot of civilization. No, everybody lives in uh, Davenport, St. Louis, and Memphis, and New Orleans. You know, I mean, they live downstream, and it's just. You know, I was I was actually trained to be a limnologist when I was a little, when I was in high school, a freshwater biologist. You know, so I would go over and collect all these uh, water samples from all over the Midwest. And I had one uh, from Sabula. It's in Illinois on the Mississippi. And I took it home and it was in a mason jar, sort of yellow water. After a week, half of it was uh, mud. And it was real mud. Too. I mean, it was just no water. No wa it wasn't, the silt was half the water, you know. But... Um, Anyway, the, the idea here is that because of who we are and where we are, we must choose to live in the stream of life that's polluted by consciousness. But, and and it's, it's, it's horrible uh, byproducts, you know. What do you think about that? You kind of shook your head, Ray. What do you think about that? Well, uh... I don't know how many people make that conscious choice. You know, I, I don't feel like a lot of people do. They, they act more like they're victims. Yeah, they just ended up there. But you're saying, um, this is where I need to be. I know that this is, this is tainted. The stream of life is tainted by consciousness. But this is where, this is, this is my life. 
This is my life. Now, you know, it, it's, of- it's like a tide coming in. It's caught everybody. Everybody's, yes. a lot of people have tried to run from it, but wherever they went to, the tide came there, you know? And, and so I don't know how conscious they are, but I said, well, hell, the thing's coming everywhere anyway. I just, you know, relaxed into it and said, okay, this, this is, this is what's happening. And I, I have to be present in it, you know? What is this? What does it mean? And be present in it and, and, and contemplate. Yeah, here is Von Franz. This is from the Handless Maiden. Uh, the demoralization through technology in our civilization uh, is uh, the abuse of getting one's. It says, uh, what, what we now lose is on the scale of our own soul. We are doing the same thing as the Miller, thinking that we are sacrificing just a bit of nature. We plan to build a new power station in the Alps, thinking that thereby we shall only lose a few trees and fields. We do not sufficiently realize our carelessness in regard to nature and are selling our souls to the devil, whereby certain psychological capacities get lost. Uh, We have electric cars and houses, but now here's the beautiful part. We miss the breathtaking moment of reality. The uncanny feeling of a dark, rainy night or the beauty of a moonlight landscape, the ever-changing aspect of nature and its natural surroundings uh, that has have been a part of man since he first came into being. The full moon, the whistling of the wind in the trees link us to instinct and the life of the unconscious past. Now that's an, uh, one aspect of the past was unconscious. Now it has a lot of consciousness in it, but is it re- it does it feed our soul? Really? I, I, so, I haven't been camping in a long time, but I remember I used to do a lot of backpacking and camping. And when you're out in in the mountains or the desert or somewhere where there's no people, you might be in a place nobody's even ever walked before a human. And and you're at the mercy of nature. You're, 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 you're in your sleeping bag at night, you can see all the stars and you're surrounded by all these sounds in nature and the darkness and all the stars and, and you're just swamped by it. And when's the last time you were there at that place? When was the last time? Yeah, it's been a long time for me. Yeah, and now, what? so the stream of life is really polluted by soullessness, life without soul. Okay, and in this, it, in the stream of life that's polluted by soullessness, we pull out uh, the the instinctive aspect of our childhood, Basco, and then we also pull out the undifferentiated anima who is still feral and will bite us, and she is black, so she's related to the the shamanic pagan realms. Okay, now. That's the world we're in here, in this dream, okay? And then we look over at the bank, and what do we, what, what is, what is the background, the, 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 this, the atmosphere and the matrix of what we're living in? What is, is, is the, uh, is underneath all this? The great mother. She represented as the mother and her babies in one of her manifestations happens to be a rabbit now uh, a, a rabbit is is one who uh who is an inexhaustible source of life don't they uh don't they have litters every three months or something like that yeah yeah um, it's amazing how fast it is i have rabbits in, in my yard not a lot but you know, there'll be a litter in there, and then they'll move on, and some more will come yeah. in and have a litter. I may be wrong. That's probably mice. Charles would know more about No, that. I think rabbits are like that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So Maybe anyway, mice are a little faster, but it's about every yeah. three months. So here's the dream ego. It's surrounded by animals. It's in the stream of life. There's a spiritual aspect to it. We're having to rescue this uh, dog from what? 60 years ago, mm-hmm. some 50, yeah, 60 years ago, still there, we're bringing it out, and uh, also then this very feral anima, 
you know. And as we're doing all this, surrounded by animals, the stream of life that has has a soulless aspect to it, you know. The Mississippi River south of of St. Louis is pretty soulless. Yeah. So and in a way, nothing's changed. No. In the background, if you're lucky and and you and, you, and you're paying attention, you could you could see the Great Mother. I mean, she's, she's still there. there. It, whatever happens, she's she's it. She's there she's somewhere. There. She's uh, she's in, indestructible. And she's inaccessible, and she's always here. You know, uh, that's what um, uh, they they said that we swim in the Pleroma. You know, the the this unconscious is is like we're we're like an aquarium everywhere we go. It is here. And she's there too, you know. So um, anyway, uh, does anybody have some sum up thoughts on this or any more thoughts about it? Jim or Gary or Charles or Dawn? It's, what, what do you think of the drink? What's the most surprising thing in the drink? I, I think that it's Bosco and the, great, and the rabbit. Uh, what, how do you put it? Um, it's... it's beautiful uh, statement. Well, there's two statements. You know, I choose the three statements. I choose to live in uh, most people. Now, isn't that that I don't think you said that, Roy. Don't you think? Well, it's a dream ego. And and I can relate to it. You know, sometimes I'll become semi-conscious in my dreams. Yes, you are somewhat. And so you're actually thinking some people move to live near water that is not polluted. That would be like moving up to northern Minnesota. Uh, but I choose to live in the place where the water is tainted by civilization and has a soulless aspect. Well, also, you have all this new development, you know, out in uh, Aspen, Colorado, and, and all these beautiful places. There shouldn't be any people living there. The developers come out there and and build all this luxury resort and stuff, and people with money they go and they live there. That that's that's uh you know we left that out. You know that's that that becomes a problem. Yeah, one thing I noticed Tim about uh, the West, you can't get a restaurant uh, reservation anymore. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, you know we tried to get one in Jack. We ended up eating at fast food places and stuff. But, you know, the pollution, you chose the pollution. Yeah, I mean, See? it's just like... It, yeah. The tide's coming, man. You just got to give into it. Yeah, uh, Banff. You know, I used to love <laughs> Banff in Alberta. And uh, now it's absolutely crazy. You want to go to Lake Louise? It looks like... Uh, it kind of looks like that uh, bridge under in Del Rio, Texas. Yeah. Oh, God. just full of mud and because I mean, everybody's parking everywhere so they can get to it you know so anyway it's um let, so let, what's the moral of the dream uh i'm just throw it out to here the moral of the dream is this is uh, uh that um um that we are are choosing to live in a stream of life that is is tainted by soullessness, and we recognize that. But we know that this this is this is the modern world. We're living in the uh, the dying uh, uh, death throes of the Piscean Age. You know where it's just this uh, soulless realm of ego, where ego is God, but we choose to live there, and yet we are pulling out of it. We're rescuing out of this soulless uh, stream of life, the instincts of our youth from 60 years ago, which is part of, I think, our childhood aspect, and also uh, uh, we're bringing out the feral anima, you know, this very uh, wild, uh, feminine part of us. And then through that, through all that, we see the goddess in animal form. And we know she's there. She'll never, like you said, She's never going to change. Uh, anything can happen in the outer world soullessly, but the great mother is still there. The one yeah. that gave you yeah. the eyes. Yeah. 
She's years. still there. Yes. I mean, you can bank on her. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And they're still fertile. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And creative. Very, yeah. a, a, every bit as fertile as she ever was. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is an interesting situation of, of what is going to happen to evolution uh, or the changing of species or whatever. Seems to be having its most uh, uh, productive time in viruses. <laughs> That's where the most... Uh, evolution is taking place oh well, yeah anyways. this is very this is very significant you bet yes. you you know mother nature's behind this it, bar- it is There's yeah viruses nature. go way back and they and they're in science fiction and and ufology and oh yeah that's a whole nother subject and very antibodies antibodies are evolving too so i mean it's it's antibodies are every bit as clever as viruses you know well, now, um, why don't we, we've got about uh, like 45 minutes left. Can, uh, I'm assuming Tim and Charles have a dream. What? I've got to leave oh. here in about 10 minutes. Uh, hey, hey, give minutes. us some more on the dolmen. Oh, yeah, I've been reading and watching YouTubes on that all week. I've been yeah, getting a rise out of it, too. Yeah, before you go, give us a little dolmen update. Well, man, I've been thinking about that a lot, too. Uh, <laughs> and reading about... Um, the uh, kind of the roots of, of archetypes and how they, they come out of nature. And, um, and I'm really feeling the resonance of the idea of these big, huge stones in, in the context of, man, this is, I feel like I'm connecting with the actual mineral aspect of the earth and that that there's some kind of, of dialogue going on between my body, the minerals in my body and the minerals in the stone. And uh, so I, I'm just feeling like it's a really big idea. Well, they feel consciousness. I mean, they're just an aspect that they are conscious. You know, I mean, uh, the, the dolmens seem uh, to be alive really i mean there's just an aspect of them that is living you know i mean it's just there's so so many in montana it's just they got more than anybody in north america it's just hundreds in montana why montana yeah and they're saying that they were uh, sort of the accidents of glaciers you know uh glacier uh, remnants but i've never seen this anywhere else oh yeah yeah that uh, that's the uh tizer that's the Tizer. Yeah. 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 I mean, I haven't seen this in any other. Uh, oh, well, like say the Alps or uh, now what, what do you think about, you know, like in the uh, in arches and, you know, I have these little rocks that are on top of uh, one little spire, you know. But but the thing is, like I was saying uh, last time, what if you lived and grew up near Stonehenge? you know, and uh, you lived in, uh, you, you went out there on, on Christmas Eve, you you go out there and you're all by yourself uh, and you're, you're it's like, it, is there a graveyard like Stonehenge? You know, I mean. Uh, Tim you, does you ever... live near Stonehenge and check yeah. out, check out uh, the Montana Dolman. Yeah. He lives right in the middle of Stonehenge. I don't know how far he is from Helena, but he, man, he's he's near it. I'm in Helena. Okay, there you go. You're in the middle of it. Yeah, so it's about that, that's zero ground zero. So yeah. that one that you just showed is just about 15 miles south of here. Oh wow, God, he isn't. He's better than Stonehenge. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so, then you also have the the Blackfoot. Uh, nation that had been there so many many years you know it is uh uh um, how about uh, eagle mountain you seen eagle mountain yeah Uh, it's up near hog mountain yep wow Wow. (laughs) charles you just uh put a chat uh uh what what is it you're saying an extremely strong opinion on the dolman rock uh, almost can't even speak about it because of so much energy 
being attracted to the idea. Uh, what, what do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, tell us. Yeah. Um, it, I'll just say that, uh, I'm strongly convinced that they were all, uh, impromptu, uh, shelters built from falling debris during a cataclysmic, uh, period in human history because some dolmen, uh, have perfectly bored holes, uh, through the top rock, which is like white hot molten uh, metal falling from um, be because of um, well I, I can't even get into it but I mean it's way too much to unpack way too much to unpack but I'm highly convinced that they're all impromptu shelters because they had the uh, engineering capabilities to move uh, and maneuver these large stones yet they're not worked at all they're just kept as raw stone. So why would they, why would they not work the stones? It's because they're all emergency shelters. Yeah, they're almost impossible to imagine how they uh, construct these. But don't you think the ma most amazing thing, at least, uh, I mean, how they did them in Stonehenge or anywhere else, or New Grange, all those places. But the the most amazing thing, Tim, is they are appearing in your so the yeah. dream maker, uh, through all this uh, this path that we've taken through the uh, this um, uh, connecting with the uh, uh, to to really I, I mean I think the the theme of our dreams is that there is an aspect in us that is uh, that 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 there's a shadow aspect in us that is hostile to uh, to the um, the uh, there's an aspect in some of the dreams that that seems to be like the husbands uh, and the crazy women you know that want to put them in in chains and stuff you know and then we but then we go to the realm of the dolmens now what's that about i mean don't you think this is this is a return to first principles I mean, well, how elemental is this? There's dolmens by the Black Sea that they say the the ancients used to go and sit in there and connect with the ancestors. And to me, that feels exactly what this what these things are oh, for. Oh yes, I think it's a, it's a it's place, all of a sudden you feel like man, history has been compressed, and I'm a part of it. <laughs> it's a return to first principles. You know, yeah. I mean, the whole idea is. Um, uh, what, what uh, is 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 the, just the inexhaustible energy of of life invincible and that joy in it the inexhaustible joy of life that is wordless and we are a part of that uh, that energy and and we we pollute it like uh, like uh, um, the stream uh, with with uh, concepts and ideas, you know, where the where this uh, ancient past, say of Lascaux, of Les Trois Frères, all the painted caves, is uh, is so much more powerful. I mean, you go into that place. I mean, you're in a temple like none that has ex ever existed on the face of the earth because it's related to the Great Mother and to the source of nature. Whatever other religion uh, has that, and the Stonehenge and all those other places are religions of the Great Mother. Yeah. They're related to, to the source of all life, you know? Yep. And so, well, anyway, you gotta go, it looks like. Yeah, but uh, what a great discussion. Thanks, you guys. Okay, well, yeah, bring it back uh, next time, Wednesday, if you can come, or next Monday, and we'll uh, go over it again. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks so much, Tim. Okay, bye. All right, uh, Charles, did you uh, want to give a dream? I know you've got one. Yeah, I just had a dream last night. It's pretty short. Um, so I was uh, going to be taking the train to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm like on the train 
and there are two other trains that are on like the tracks right by it so there's three trains all really close to each other moving the same direction at about the same speed and there's like doors opened on the train so i can jump from one to another and i'm on the new orleans train and it's the memory's kind of foggy but i'm like kind of jumping from one to the other i guess for fun and after jumping around a minute, I'm like, hey, which train is this one? And he's like, oh, this is the Chicago train. And then I jump onto another one and they're like, oh, this is the, it's like some Northern state, like Mich Michigan or Minnesota or something. And then I'm like, oh, that's the New Orleans train is like all the way, you know, on the opposite side of me. And then I get back on the Chicago train and the New Orleans one, like, it, I guess it, the track veers to the side or it like, you know, just shoots off and, you know, it leaves us regardless of how it, I, I was just unable to jump back onto that train. And so I'm on the Chicago train and it, it like turns into a bus. And I know at some point it'll meet up with the New Orleans train again. So I'm like, okay, I just have to stay on this train and I'll meet up with the New Orleans train again. It'll be okay. But yeah, like I said, it turns into a bus and it stops and I get off and I'm on the street uh, corner and the bus just takes off without me at like 90 miles an hour. Um, and now I'm just stranded and um, I get like violently upset and um, I start crying and I'm really angry. And I'm like, just why do I always do this? Why do I do this? This is why I don't have any friends and I don't have any relationships. I just, I just jump off when like, there's really no need to. Yeah, well that and, is, yeah. um, now this is a recurring theme. Uh, we remember we had the dream last time of the, of the uh, uh, our wife, who was Rachel's, uh, our, wh wh what was her name? Rachel. She was, uh, it was Ronald's wife. Ronald. Uh, her wife. name's Brooke. Oh, Brooke. And uh, she was on a, a, a train. We were going down to the tracks, and and we took a train back from Maine. So we're having a lot of dreams about trains. You know, now a train is a place that where there's a fixed route. You follow uh, these, um, you know, parallel uh, lines like that, and yet there's three tra three trains going along simultaneously, and we can jump from one car to the other. Now we're showing. Um, now this is again that flightiness, you know, that um, so the unconscious is worrying. Oh, warning! Seems like it's warning us about our. Um, the tendency of the Pawer to be a little flighty. Now, remember, your father wanted to have his car to be a camper, so he didn't have to stay any one place very long. Okay, but um, now, so so anyway, you lost contact with the train that's going to take you down to New Orleans, and but you're you but you know that the bus the the train is transferred into a bus. In, uh, that is going to Chicago, will eventually, you think, will meet with New Orleans, but you get off, and it says, sorry, you shouldn't have got off. And it just, it just, um, like, almost at light speed disappears, okay, and leaves us stranded there. So then there is a conscious realization at that point that this is of our own doing. Now, you, you mentioned this is why you don't have any relationship, why you don't have any friends, and uh, but why you don't have um, maybe uh, the, uh, uh, you, you know, your career needs to, to your, your career suffers because of the flightiness as well, you know. So now this is a different type of angst 
than the one where the um, the darkness was descending upon uh, us, uh, uh, you know, and, and it was sort of the barren um, uh, lunar realm that never uh, bears children was going to to separate us from the sun, which was going down. This um, angst is a little more practical. You know, uh, it isn't so uh, so uh, you, you know related to uh, uh, you know uh, just uh, a very. Uh, th this is a practical dream. I mean, we we uh, we realize in the dream that our flightiness is separating us from life. Okay, I mean, not just from friends, relationships, etc. It's separating us from life. You know, uh, and uh, uh, now, why did the Chicago bus just disappear like uh, at warp speed when we got off it? That's an interesting question. Uh, Roy, do you have any uh, comments on this? Oh, yeah, I'm going with uh, Cal Shed on this one, man. He got a glimpse of, of the daemon, the survival self, not his personal spirit set him up for failure and then all this negativity comes in to you know to keep him from discovering you know what happened to him that's classic he's had a lot of dreams like that he if he looks at it i agree with everything you said craig but it's just another way to get to the same place you know yeah and but there seems to be i mean all i'm saying is there seems to be a realization that didn't exist in the other dreams that this is uh that there, there's an aspect where, where the, the moon, the lunar world was coming down upon us and we seem to have no control. In this dream, we seem to realize that we do have some control here, you know, and we, we know that there's an issue. Now, when did you have this dream, Tim, or Charles? This was uh, last night or the night before. I'm pretty sure it's last uh, night, actually. It's amazing, too, that it's, it's connecting New Orleans and the train with that. You know, are you going to go down there in a train, maybe? Yeah, I leave on the 11th. Okay. All right. Wow. That's not very long from now. What do you think, Gary? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's positive because, um, you know, the awareness is starting to happen. It's starting to, you know, the, 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 the response, you know, there's the, the nature of taking responsibility for what's been happening and, and seeing it. And that's the important part is it's like, you know, things don't just happen to us. They happen to us. And, you know, we, we create the, the situation or the circumstances where those things can come about. So, it, you know, it's not that it's good, but the awareness is happening. And, and until you're, you know, until the awareness increases and you see the pattern, you see the archetype, you can't step outside of it. So, yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, it is. Now, see, um, I think, why didn't we just stay on the train that was going to New Orleans? I mean, you know, why did we jump uh, back and forth? It reminds me of this one uh, person I know who had a, a dream. I think you met him, Gary, that David O'Donoghue. You know, he's, uh, he's going somewhere and, and he's got 50 pairs of shoes. With him. You know, he can't decide which pair to wear. He's got too many interests. Now, in this case, we didn't stay on the train that's going to New Orleans. We're, we're jumping back and forth and back and forth. And then maybe... Maybe we can get to New Orleans by the direct, indirect route. Well, first of all, you know, if you're going to Chicago, you're going in a northeast direction. If you're going to, uh, to, to Michigan, you're going in northeast direction. If you're going to New Orleans, you're going due south, you know. So why the, the trains would be going parallel when one is going due south and the other ones are going almost due north, uh, you know, they're going in two different directions. So we're, we're 
so so the trains eventually are going in two different directions. And the one that's going south is the one we need to be on. But we jump on the train that's going north, you know? And well, we think, well, eventually it's gonna meet up with the train that's going. To, I mean, if you're in St. Louis and you're going on a train to, uh, to New Orleans, I mean, basically, why would it go any direction but just due south? You know, go through Missouri, through Arkansas, through Louisiana, you know, right down to New Orleans. You know, I mean, why would it, it may take the indirect route to go to Chicago? So there's this ah, 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 aspect of that we, we have, instead of, of the straightest point between two, uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, we're taking this, this uh, very complicated indirect route uh, and saying, well, we'll eventually end up there anyway. But, and here's the other, the beautiful aspect. And, and you tell me, Charles, how, how this is. There's three choices going along parallel. Okay, we jump from one to the other. Now the one we need to be on is the farthest away from us. I mean, that's what you said, didn't you? And uh, you were on the train in Chicago, which is all the way on the other side. But that's the one we need to be on. And so, um, so the unconscious is talking to us right now. And it's saying, I think this is that we need to uh, show some uh, focus and direction, which has been heretofore lacking. You know, I mean, we can't be jumping from train to train. We can't take the indirect we can't get to New Orleans by going north first, you know. I mean, so uh, the, the it, this kind of seems like a warning, don't you think, Charles? Now, wh what's your route uh, on the 11th? Where, uh, where, where do you uh, pick the train up and where does some of it stop? I have to go to, I have to get someone to give me a ride to Carbondale, Illinois, mm -hmm. and then I take the train from there all the way down it to probably Orleans. goes down to memphis and mm -hmm. i don't know and, uh, it's like a 12 13 hour mississippi. Ride. Mm -hmm. mississippi you think i guess i mean it seems like a pretty straight shot but um i don't know yeah um, well i've been um you know i've been thinking about this job and i um you know, I don't know how good it's going to be for me in a way um, to stay at long term because, like I said, like I won't, it's not a permanent, it, it's a permanent job. It's just not permanently in New Orleans. New Orleans. It's yeah. a month and a half there and then two weeks off, then a month and a half anywhere else. I mean, it could be anywhere. But well, I is the, are the other ones temporary too. Um, it just depends on how long they have the contract for. It's it's I guess it's divided into month and a half contract increments. Um, but she, you know, my boss said that uh, apparently you can like buy a route, like you can. I don't know. I don't know exactly what she means, but apparently you can like purchase the rights to an area to deliver to and then you could just deliver there for however many years you wanted to um i don't know if i want to do that but just i don't know if the wandering is going to help me too much but at the same time um i'm like i, I don't know you know i well, just don't know I, I, who knows it, the only thing i can say is is it the pay is good you know, and it might lead to something else, you know, a, a connection or of some type, uh, you know, but what the, the, uh, the dream seems to be just saying um, that, you know, be focused. It doesn't matter what you do. I mean, this is what Young says about us, wears. It doesn't matter what you do. Just pick one thing and stick to it. 
you know, don't be jumping from train to train and, and uh, like that, you know, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Gary is, uh, Gary's okay. He's got a little bit of, you're, you're okay, Gary, aren't you? I think uh, Don's worried about you that you're, I, I think off. he's yeah. got a little bit of a thyroid situation. Yeah, I've uh, got a thyroid. That, <laughs> yeah, that makes you a little. Uh, I last yeah, till about and, eight, and then after that, I'm like barely yeah. there. Okay. All right. Well, um, did you have another dream, Charles or Roy or Gary or Don? You want to introduce? I do. If no one, oh, okay. No, yeah. Go, well, go, why go. don't you go ahead? I mean, oh, it looked you, like Don has one. Okay, Don, you have one. Okay, go ahead, Don. All right, let me see uh, what it says here. Let me get it. Let's see if I can get it in there. Uh, thank you, Don. I'm so glad that you do this. All right, this is from 10 1, 10 3 21. Oh my God. This is pretty recent, too. All right. Is it? Uh, okay. All right, let's put it in here. I don't think this this is a long one, so I well, we can at least read it. Let me see here. Yeah. Uh, Charles, if you have a dream, uh, why don't you get? Uh, well, you can tell it to me uh, later, and uh, I'll I'll type it up. Maybe we can go over it, pre go over it. Okay, um, flying like ET. Now, okay, this is a classic dawn dream. There is a guy shaving soap the way you grate. He is taking a lot of time and effort, and he's starting to sweat. He's doing all this because this is how he takes a picture, okay? He shaves soap. Uh, I see an image that is like the picture that goes with the movie E.T., a boy on his bike in front of the moon. Words go with the image, and they are uh, flying between between two bridges. After waking, I had trouble remembering this because to me, the opposite is what makes sense. Traveling a bridge between uh, two places. But we're here, we're flying between two bridges, okay? And, and so we're not traveling on a bridge between two places, we're flying between two bridges. ET is. Uh, or this uh, boy on a bicycle. The next image I feel uh, like was related to the bike in front of the moon image. The second of the two, the second was of two stocks with one being folded into another. Now is this two stocks or socks? Yeah, two socks. What'd you say, Gary? That's what I wanted to know, too. Is it a sock or a stock? Socks. socks. Okay, yeah. The second was of two socks, one being folded into another. It's a standpoint, you know. Uh, my dad comes, and, and, and it's similar to the two bridges. You know, a, to a standpoint uh, that are being folded into each other. My dad comes and asks me what I have to drink. I struggle, struggle to think. As my mind is barely able to think in a dream, I managed to come up with fragments just blurting out strawberry, tea, lemonade, juice. Okay, uh, my father asked me what I have to drink. I have strawberry, tea, lemonade, juice. Then he asked why I wear headphones all the time. Again, I struggle to think of an answer. Now I'm starting to wake. And my mind is asking me uh, what I did all day. And then it stops. Um, uh, what is it? What's the end of it? What I did all day the day before. I realized I had been cleaning, uh, 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 but it wasn't easy for the answer to come out of me. Okay. What I did the day before. And this is, this is, I do this all the time. People ask me questions. I can't answer. You know, I just, I, this, this, have, this, this is all these things where call 911, call 911. Um, okay, uh, uh, let's see, the day before. Okay, I, I got it here now. 
All right. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through it one more time. And then let's just, uh, I think we're going to finish this one on Wednesday, Don, but it's beautiful. I love that it's so uh, recent. Okay. All right. So let's start again. Um, there is a guy uh, who, the guy is going to take a picture. And the way he takes a picture, now, now what does it mean to take a picture? That means that you um, take a device, you point it at a scene, light comes through a lens, goes back onto a uh, uh, some kind of uh, a device that uh, that captures um, the light and dark aspects of whatever is coming through the lens and freezes it on that uh, on that um, sort of a photo. Uh, uh, light um, recording substance, okay? So there's a guy shaving soap. So now soap is uh, something that um, is uh, a cleansing agent or something that you clean yourself with. And he is uh, he's working very hard and he's sweating doing it. Now he's doing this all this because this is how he takes a picture. So it is extremely important for him to preserve the image of something. We don't really know what it is. Okay. That's the first part of the dream. Now, the second part of the dream doesn't seem to be, re it, it, it's coming out of the first, but it's, it's a different, we move to a different scene. Okay. Now the dream ego first of all, saw the person who records images, okay? Now, th that person who records images see, is, seems to be the one who's producing these. Now, so, so what we are seeing are the images that the person in the first paragraph produced through shaving soap, <laughs> okay? All right, so I got a bar of soap, and I'm, I'm shaving it up into little... Uh, to powder, you know, and this this is a cleansing agent. So uh, the it, it seems that the uh, uh, images have are possibly have something to do with cleansing. Okay, now we see a, a image of a boy on the bike in front of the moon. The animus and the moon are related. They're being superimposed on each other. So the animus is related to the moon. So it's sort of the child of the moon, you know, and words go with the image. And the words are uh, flying between two bridges. That's that that's uh, was the caption uh, of the of the uh, picture, right, uh, Dawn? Flying between, between two bridges. Okay. And after I awake, I had trouble remembering this because uh, the opposite is what makes sense, traveling a bridge between two places. So this is really interesting. Um, okay, so you guys got kind of got this, I, I'm getting a hint, but I'm gonna go through it a little fast, but that that is, uh, I, I got a little hint on that. The uh, image first uh, someone produced is, is taking a lot of effort to produce images. The images he produces are the uh, animus, the, the growing animus who superimposed in front of the moon and the words underneath say flying between two bridges. Okay, the animus is a bridge to the unconscious. Okay, the anima is a bridge between ego and the unconscious. Okay, so, but there's, I'm the animus is flying between two bridges. The next image uh, was related to the bike in front of the moon. The second was of the second image. Uh, this is the second image. The next image is of two stocks being folded into another. Oh, isn't that wonderful? You've got a stock, a uh, two stocks, and um, one is being folded into the other. Now my wife does this. She always pairs up my socks and they're kind of in a little bundle 
where one encloses the other, you know. And so now that pairs are saved. Okay, that's the second. So there's been three images now. The, the, the person who creates a cleansing image. The second is that the animus is related to the moon and they're uh, also related to, it, it, the animus is flying between two bridges. The next is, uh, um, is related to the first one and it's of one sock being folded into another. So it has something to do with the two bridges, but it has something to do with two feet or a standpoint. Okay, now the third aspect, uh, fourth aspect, my dad comes and asks me what I had to drink. Uh, you can't, now two times we can't think of the answer. Uh, we're being asked two questions. One is, what do you have to drink? The other is, why do you wear headphones all the time? And in both cases, we don't know how to answer. We're sort, we, we have no answer for the, um, for the father realm. You know, I mean, okay, Roy, uh, we don't have much time, but let's just get a start on it. What do you think? Oh, gee, well, I like the image maker. He's working really hard. You know, he, he really wants to communicate with Don. He's working really hard. And uh, she's getting the image, this E.T. movie thing, kid in front of the moon. And... Both make sense to me, flying between two bridges or traveling a bridge between two places. So, and then she kind of loses it. And then as she says later, she felt like all these questions being asked her, to her by her father and stuff is like to help her remember, you know, help her remember. And she does have dreams where she's floating between two places. And she seems to sink back down. She can't seem to sustain it. But the image maker isn't giving up. You know, hopefully she can remember more images just yeah, to start well, off things. Yeah, flying like ET. I mean, it's just this realm between the spiritual realm and the lunar realm. That see, she, there's a spiritual aspect and the lunar aspect. One is feminine, one is the mother, one is the father. What do you think, Gary? Well, so the shaving the soap to create an image. Soap is something we use on our skin. We feel with our skin. You know, this is not an image, that, a picture that's being done through the intellect from the mind. This is something that's being done through feeling. So... The, the images that are trying to be produced are not symbols. They are, you know, they're related to things that we need to sit with and feel them. So, you know, I would suggest that Don, you know, Try to you go in and you go into this and you you know you just try to feel the aliveness in the various parts without trying to pull out meaning. If you try to pull out meaning, you know, it'll get intellectualized, you know, you'll because this, I mean, this novel way of taking pictures is just really beautiful. You know, taking a bar of soap and creating many fine particles out of it, which is going to allow us to get closer, to cover a larger area, to form the image from the soap, which is the feeling. That's, that's how I'm seeing it. Yeah, it's the magic that is, creates the image. He's the magician. And then he's, he's doing his magic, but here's how he does it. It's a lot of work, but we got to keep that in mind. So these four parts, uh, let, let's just finish uh, uh, with uh, Charles. Charles, you're going to be leaving a week from today too, right? Yeah, I'll be leaving really early Monday morning. Okay. Well, I hope, hope we can, you can keep, uh, I don't know what your schedule is, but six days a week. Well, what do you think about, uh, do you have any comments on this one? 
Um, I was just curious if Don remembers like what the setting was like at all, like where, like when she says her dad comes and asks her what she had to drink. Like, I was just curious, like, you know, where are you? What is the environment like in this? Just because it doesn't say anything about that. That's all. I I, I, I would see um, my grandmother, I would read some legal documents and it would have uh, say, comes now before the court and then it had my grandmother's name. And I could just see her just coming out of this whiteness. <laughs> you know, a cloud just comes out of it. But what, what do you think, uh, Dawn? Are you anywhere or are you like in a house or are you, do you know? Uh, she oh, thinks you she think you were in li- her living room. You think she was in, in her living room. Okay. Well, um, le- le- I did you, does that help you, Charles? Or? Um, it gives me, you know, a missing piece for me to think about it. Um, okay. Well, we can finish this up Wednesday, Wednesday but uh, there are four parts to the dream. The uh, image maker, the image of the uh, animus uh, who superimposed against the moon, and the secret voice of the self says, flying between two bridges. What does that mean? And then the third uh, aspect is the um, uh, third aspect. I, I lost my place. Uh, well, well, there, there, there's the third aspect is the uh, sock being folded into one another. And the fourth aspect are the two questions, uh, which uh, in, in both cases, when the father asks them, we can't answer. I mean, we, we just can't think of an answer. So we're sort of um, s- sort of stupefied. Uh, I, I'm this way all the time. People ask me something. I look up at them like a deer in the headlights. What? <laughs> anyway, well, thank you. We'll start on Dawn's dream. And then, Charles, uh, if you have a dream, uh, why don't you uh, bring it, bring you the one you had or, or, or even a more fascinating one. But I'm glad to see you smiling anyway. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Roy and, and Gary and Charles and Don and Tim, wherever you are. Okay, we'll see you guys Wednesday. See you. Bye now.